Good morning, good afternoon and good evening from India. This is Sunil Khosla, your host for the day. A very warm welcome and thanks to all of you joining us from across the globe for the very first episode of Global Paytech Podcast. The Paytech Podcast is presented to you by AJS Horizon. This podcast series would host some of the leading individuals from payments, fintech, innovation and global synergies. This is our genuine attempt at creating an engagement platform that supports holistic growth in the payments technology domain. Let's look at our guest for the day. We have a very special gentleman to kickstart this exciting journey. Please welcome Mr. Stewart Beck joining us from Canada. Stewart is the president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation Canada and is a well-known figure in the diplomatic circle, having served as a Canadian High Commissioner to India with concurrent accreditation to the Kingdom of Bhutan and Nepal. Let's hear from the great man himself. Thank you, Stewart, for gracing our inaugural podcast with your presence. Our listeners are very eager to know more about you. Over to you now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sunil. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and to, to share a few minutes to talk about uh, India. Just uh, some background on myself. I, uh, I might have been a high commissioner to India, but I spent 32 years of my career as a trade commissioner. And at the very beginning, I opened Canada's trade office in uh, Silicon Valley. So innovation and technology have been a very important part of my career uh, over the many years. Wow. Further proof that we've got the perfect guest for our inaugural episode. Indeed, technology and innovation are two greatest engines for bringing positive change and the building blocks of ages horizon as well. Before we get on with the topic of the day, Stewart, you were the Canadian High Commissioner to India for four years, and I'm sure your, our listeners would be as excited as I am to know about your experience here in India. The things you learn from, and any particular thing you miss about India the most. Uh, well, Sunil, I have to say, uh, India was a fabulous uh, assignment for me. Uh, I had spent, you know, uh, as I said, 30 years in the, or 28 years at that point in time in the Foreign Service, and uh, I had been to uh, spent the first part of my career in the United States, and then I, I spent uh, eight years in Greater China. And then going coming to India, I was often asked, "What's the difference between China and India?" And as much as I enjoyed my experience, uh, the four years in Taiwan was a fabulous experience, and four years in Shanghai, there's a difference uh, between a big difference between China and India, as you can imagine. Not just the cultural dimensions, but India, you know, was behind China in some, in many ways in the infrastructure space, but uh, there's a big difference in the context of, of how people approach things. And what I really enjoyed about my time in India is the openness uh, and the friendship uh, that you that you develop with the people that you work with here. It's not that you don't have uh, friendships uh, in a place like China, it's just a different type of relationship between the political relationship and, uh, and you know, you have the, the party and you have the bureaucracy and it's much more difficult to get to know and understand people the same way that you can in India. I often tell people, you know, the best advice that was given to me by one of my predecessors was go to book launches because at book launches, you get to meet ministers and senior bureaucrats and people and they like to talk and laugh and have a good time. And I had so many great, great evenings at different receptions where you could talk politics, but you could also talk about your family. So India was really a, a wonderful experience from that perspective. And uh, I take that away and, and it's really, I miss the friendships that I have. And over four years, I still communicate with those people that I met um, almost weekly uh, and, and staying in touch. And that's, that's in some ways the difference between China and India. It's not that China isn't friendly, it's just harder to make the same types of friendships, that's all. Stewart, it's no surprise then that you then joined Asia Pacific Canada, extending your relationship with the geography, and we know how great this organization is. Throw some light on APF as an organization, its functionalities, and its objectives. So uh, the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada was set up in the mid 80s uh, by the current prime minister's father, Pierre Trudeau. Uh, at that point in time, I think if you remember, um, Japan was having a growing influence in, in, the, in the context of North America. And the foundation uh, was set up just to, in, to basically bring the attention of the importance of Asia to the Canadian public. And our, it was set up at, under an act of legislation, uh, an act of parliament, I should say. So it, we're a legislative body. 
Uh, we are an arm's length organization from the Canadian government, but the sole purpose of what we do is really to be a catalyst for engagement with Asia, uh, all of Asia, not just with any one particular country, and also to be able to bring an understanding of different cultures and how people operate. So it's economic and uh, fundamentally, it's a, we, we look at economic issues and how we build our economic relationships. But now, because of what's happening glo uh, globally, we're looking at the geo geopolitical, geostrategic relationships and how can Canada navigate that in the context of, uh, of the importance of Asia, which is kind of fundamentally over the next two decades or three decades, the most important part of the world for people to understand. How do you see then the relationship between Canada and Asian countries developing over the next three years? Well, I think it's a very timely question, Sunil, because when you take a look at Asia right now, a lot of it's being defined by the relationship between uh, the United States and China. And you have to look at Asia through those eyes to a certain degree. Uh, for Canada, uh, you know, the United States is our largest trading partner. It's right next door. We have this friendship that we've had for many, 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 many years. It's just a reality of, of our existence. Uh, and China, of course, is our second largest trading partner. So now we're in a situation where we have to kind of navigate uh, what would what I would say are dueling superpowers. Um, so for Canada, uh, what we need to understand is how to diversify into the region and build other, not that we don't have strong relationships already with countries in Asia, but how do we build those in a way that will benefit us, not just economically, but politically. And so over the next three years, that the diversification strategy will be quite fundamental. India, of course, plays a very important role uh, in Canada's diversification strategy. And over the course of the four years that I was in India, it was how we built those relationships, uh, particularly in critical areas such as food security, energy security, uh, infrastructure, education. And that we can do across other countries in Asia as well, particularly in the context of some of the key issues facing the world right now, climate change, uh, environmental remediation, food security, and the work that Canada is doing domestically has a tremendous application into the region. So for the next three years, what we, we are looking at at the foundation in particular is you know, where we have strengths, artificial intelligence, machine learning. How can we use that to our advantage in places like India, uh, ASEAN, uh, and to uh, a degree other, other countries uh, that we have long traditional relationships, Japan, Korea. Uh, and how we can use that to our advantage. So governance is an important element in that. Uh, but also, what can we do with our companies, which we have some very, very good companies in this space? How do we connect that uh, to what's going on in the region? So, for three, for you know, certainly for the next decade, this is what we will, we we are encouraging Canadians and the Canadian government, and from a policy perspective, how do we bring focus to our relationships in Asia? That's going to be critical. The second thing is the reverse of that, and uh, Canada's historical immigration patterns have been from uh, Europe. Uh, the UK, obviously. Uh, but if you look, take a look at the last 10 years, our three largest source countries um, are from Asia. So uh, it's the Philippines, India, and Japan. And over the last 10 years, it's been, spent, it's been bouncing back and forth between the three countries as to which one is number one. So our country is changing in many, many ways. Uh, the face of the country, quite frankly, is changing in many ways. And one of the things that we need to do in the role of the foundation here is to build Asia competence within Canada's own uh, domestic fabric. And we spend quite a bit of time and effort on doing that, is really educating people to what is the reality of Asia and how we can better connect to it. Absolutely wonderful, Stuart. The three keywords that I've picked is diversification, climate change, and Asia competency. And I'm happy to know that India can be a good partner for this. So, without further ado, let's get into the topic for the day. That is, the Indian market and its infinite possibilities for global technology startups. As we all know, India with its sheer size and population is a fantastic growth prospect for organizations across the globe. And over the last few years, we have seen an incredible surge in international brands making headway into India. Just like any other market, India also presents its own unique sets of challenges. And it's pivotal to be well versed with such challenges before devising the right strategy. And we have the perfect man to lead the conversation on the topic. To start off the discussions, 
let me ask you the three advices you will give to any organization planning to enter the Indian market. Well, Sunil, uh, I'll be perfectly honest. India is not the easiest market for Canadian companies in particular to enter uh, after so many years uh, being focused on the United States where it's the same, I won't call it the same culture because it's not essentially the same culture, but the same legal system. It's very easy to get to from a transportation perspective. Um, you know, just the, the sense of doing and ease of doing business distribution and whatever is quite, it comes quite easily to Canadian companies. So if you take a look at India, it's much more complex and much more difficult uh, for a variety of different reasons. But I always say there's three things that are important for anybody coming into the Indian market. First is planning. Okay. So it's the three P's essentially. The first is planning. The second is pa uh, patience. And the third is perseverance. Okay. And I'll, I'll break that out into the three. So from a planning perspective, you just can't come to India and say, okay, I'm going to set up shop and do business. It doesn't work that way. Uh, you need to really understand and you need to develop uh, relationships uh, to be able to fully understand what's involved in the market. Because as you know, uh, Tamil Nadu is, is, is very different than Kerala and Kerala is, Kerala is very different than Gujarat and Gujarat is very different than West Bengal. So you have a huge country with very different cultures and different business practices running across the country. So if you are coming into India, you really have to plan your thinking and take a look at it and understand how best to approach it. And it's hard to do that on your own. So there's a fourth P which I would put into this, and I, I think we'll probably talk about it a little later anyway, but it's partnership. So understanding how you go into the market, you really need to have a docent or a guide or a partner to help you go through the process. On, persever on, um, on uh, perseverance, there are lots of hurdles and challenges going into an Indian market. So it's huge. The opportunity is enormous. The numbers are staggering these days. The growth rates that are happening in India are remarkable. Uh, but you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be successful right at, at the outset. So you have to be able to, uh, to have the financial wherewithal and the stamina to persevere a lot of the hurdles that you're going to encounter. And that's important. And again, you know, when companies would come to, to Delhi and we'd have a conversation, I'd say, you have to have the appetite to, for this. But I can tell you, if you do, uh, and you're willing to make those investments and persevere, you will be very successful and you'll be very satisfied with the, with the results. And then on the, on the final um, uh, uh, area, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about um, uh, patience because it takes time. Uh, and, you know, I've seen uh, one company in particular, which had a wonderful product. Uh, they persevered uh, and they were patient. And it was really took them from the time that they started in the market uh, until they were ultimately successful uh, about five years. Okay. And now that they're in the market and, and they, they've been that patient, they're beginning to reap the benefits. So there's a difference between perseverance and patience. Uh, patience is to be able to say, there are going to be lots of um, lots of hurdles that we're gonna, I'm going to encounter, lots of setbacks. But if I'm patient and I have the right partners, uh, I'll be able to overcome this. I'm sure soon students in B schools will be studying four P's of business expansion by Stewart Beck. And it is the fourth P that you added, partnership, that I would focus on next. It's an area that needs careful consideration when you are setting up shop in a new country. Do you go solo or do you find the right partner? And venture together. How do you make that decision? Well, I have to say, uh, Sunil, my my own view, and this is um, uh, this is over, as I said, thirty two years of experience as a trade commissioner. Uh, it's always difficult uh, unless you're in a market like the United States, because you know the trade back and forth across the border is essentially borders essentially one market. But when you go into foreign markets, truly foreign markets outside of North America. Uh, to go today to go into those markets and and sell through traditional distribution channels is very difficult. So you have to really understand the, the importance of having a partner uh, to be uh, successful in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain market. So in the case of India, if you're a tech startup, uh, most tech companies coming out of Canada are quite small. They don't have necessarily have the financial wherewithal. So it's really important that they understand what they're uh, what they have to offer. And who would be the right partner for them to uh, explore the opportunities? And as you know, in, in India, you have large family houses and large companies uh, that uh, 
cut across a number of different sectors. So if you are, and I'll take an example, a clean tech company uh, that does water remediation um, or any variety of different areas for water because water is such a critical uh, resource for India. So who do you work with and how do you decide because you have a good product, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate its, its functionality and you have to work with the right company uh, to do that. So I would encourage uh, startups coming from Canada to take a look at how they get into the ecosystem. And they can do that through working with uh, similar companies and you can do your research today to find out, okay, who can I work with that would be a synergistic partner that could be a small company because together we can go into uh, into the large companies like the Tatas and Birlas and uh, Tar Larson and Tubros and, uh, and a variety of different companies that you could, you could work with in that particular space. Uh, but it, again, you, it's going to be very difficult unless you've got something that's really unique um, to be able to go into the market in India and, and be successful. So collaboration is really quite critical because to start from scratch, it's very expensive and to build a network that's very cost, uh, it's very time consuming. So these are the things that I would recommend is, you know, take your time, plan, as I said, you'll find the right type of partner. You have to be able to demonstrate that your product is, is successful and then, you know, work together with them to, to capitalize on the market. There's always concerns about IP, uh, particularly with, uh, with technology-driven companies. Uh, I've always said that you know, how you manage IP in India is probably in some ways quite easy um, compared to some other markets in Asia because of the common law legal system and other ways that you can work with uh, IP in India. So it's, it's a concern, but it's not a concern that would stop me from going into the particular market. So working together with, a, with the right company, I think you see, see all sorts of advantages. I completely agree with you, Stuart. And I'm happy to announce formally that Aegis Horizon has now synergized with two Canadian fintech startups and exciting expansion plans ahead. I would also want to get your perspective on India's growth in the fintech sector in the last few years. I don't know. Um... In the next five years, I think they're prior, they're up in the top in, in many ways right now. So yes, of course, over the next five years, I think uh, India will be um, uh, will be a tech leader, uh, and in, in a variety of different areas, not just in the fintech space. Uh, there'll be other areas that they'll be successful, and, and a lot of that I put to, and this is one of those great advantages of being um, an ambassador or high commissioner in the context of Canada. Uh, in a place like India, because you get to meet some really interesting people. And one of the mo most interesting, well, I met so many interesting people. They're all all very uh, uh, unique in that sense. Um, but one uh, in particular was Nanda Nilakani. And at that time, he was putting Ad Adhar in place. And we would have lunches together. He'd come to, the, to our official residence in Delhi, and we would have a conversation over lunch about what he was doing and how he was doing this. And, you know, the scale of what he was doing was enormous and the size of his organization to do that was, I really, I mean, quite frankly, I, I was, it was remarkable how small it was relative to what the, ta the task at hand was. And to be able to provide digital identity to a billion people is, you know, a, a, you know, a remarkable feat. And what he, how he was thinking about it and the vision associated with it, it, it was, you know, and convincing his fellow colleagues in the in information technology space of why they should be contributing their best people to this project. It was all about how you could use this, not again, not invading people's privacy and the such like, but how you can build an ecosystem, a technology ecosystem around having that digital identification. And, uh, you know, listening to him and maybe realize that, you know, quite frankly, uh, the number of very, very smart people in India and, how they were positioning a lot of what they were doing with this would mean leadership in many areas going forward, just because of the skill size, the, the, the sheer size of the databases that would be generated. And that, of course, you know, again, from a Canadian perspective, where we have leadership and machine learning, you know, data will help drive all sorts of technology and digital innovation. And quite frankly, uh, it was remarkable how that was really a foundation in many ways. And that was started would have been what I mean, seven or eight years ago now, Sinal, I think that uh, Ed Har was uh, was started. But anyway, it was to yeah. me it was a, a remarkable feat, and um, and you know kudos to you know to India 
for understanding the importance of having digital identity because all of a sudden it, it provides opportunities for people who, who didn't have those opportunities in the past. And as one of the things that uh, you know, we often run into in foreign markets as, as Canadian, you know, Canadian companies and you know, basically the value systems and how we do, about, how we do business, Corruption is always something that we have to think about, and one of the things that that um, um, that uh, Nandan Nandan Nilakani was telling me is that you know you take a look at corruption and there's retail corruption and wholesale corruption, and you know there's not much in some ways you can do about wholesale corruption, but doing what they were doing with Adhar really dealt with the, the issue of retail corruption, and I, and I think that's a that's very very true, and again it has a very positive impact on not just uh, uh, the ability for people to do basic banking, as an example, but it does change the dynamic of the economy and how uh, people operate within the economy. Indeed, Aadhaar and UPI were the cornerstones of Indian digital adoption story. And we at AGS are very proud to play our part in the incredible leap the country has made in digital adoption as well as financial inclusion in the last five years. Hope you're having a good time listening to the first episode of Global Paytech podcast series. The conversation would continue and you can catch it from episode 1, part 2 on the Aegis Horizon channel. If you like what you heard, please like the podcast and subscribe to our channel. And if you have any suggestions, we would love to hear from you. Leave a comment below or reach out to us through our social media handles. All links are given in the description. Catch you there in part 2. And it's a cut.